What's the best way to address you? Mickey. Mickey, perfect. All right. Mickey, you're joining us. Are you in Tel Aviv? Is that where you're at? Yeah, I'm in Tel Aviv. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thank you uh, so much for coming on. I think uh, Zach's already recording right now, but uh, I saw, you know, I read your the article you helped co-author, Man the Fat Hunter, a while back, and fascinating to me. And I just thought it was just, just you know, just tremendous information in there. And so I wanted to, you know, kind of touch on that. I know you sent me some new information on a couple other papers you've been involved with. Can you, can you just give us a little bit of your background for those that don't know you? Uh, I know you're doing some anthropologic research and doing some PhD level stuff uh, with that regard. Can you just kind of briefly give us a five minute synopsis of what's going on in your life in the last little bit here, if you don't mind? Well, I was born about uh, 67 years ago <laughs> in Israel. Uh, I studied economics as a BA degree, and then uh, an MBA I did in uh, France, in INSEAD, Fontainebleau. Uh, and then about, when I was about 52, I decided to retire and uh, go do other things. Uh, and, and this had a lot to do with my uh, understanding of hunter-gatherers and of our genetic background, uh, in which uh, we lived in a, in a completely different environment, or we developed, and our genes are adapted to a completely different uh, environment than the one that we live in today. And this is a source, or the source of a lot of stress for me. And I realize also for other people that live in hierarchic, hierarchical uh, situations. So I decided to, that I had enough money to uh, retire. And I retired. I went to the university. I uh, studied quite a few things. Poetry, uh, writing, uh, uh, all kind of stuff, including uh, um, prehistory. Uh, at, at the Tel Aviv uh, um, Archaeological Department. And uh, at, at one stage, I decided to uh, leave and to write a book, a book that uh, I eventually called uh, Sneaking into Paradise, which was about uh, what I did, in fact, right? About uh, how, to, how, how to sneak into paradise and how to leave uh, the the world of uh, working and uh, and uh, managers and and uh, subordinates and live uh, like like a hunter gatherer should uh, free uh, autonomic uh, with intimacy and uh, that was the book that I wrote and while writing this book I decided to write a chapter about a uh, paleo diet. Now, I knew that paleo diet was good for you. That was a no-brainer for me. Uh, but uh, what I didn't know, and, and as I was researching to write this chapter, was the terrible, shocking. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm getting excited now. This has been <laughs> nine years ago. I was flabbergasted, I was shocked to understand the effect of the uh, current uh, dietary recommendation on our health. That's why I asked you to talk about uh, McCarrison, because this is where I uh, got that information. That, I mean, that is very fascinating. It's interesting, you know, that you, you can have a, a second act in life, so to speak. You know, you start out in, in an economics and then just totally change change gears. And I think that's so so neat for people. I'm in my 50s now and kind of doing the same sort of thing where I've kind of changed a lot. Different than I thought, you know, 10 years ago, I would never thought I'd, I would have been here. But not, but here I am. And so it's very fascinating to see that stuff. Good, so, good. So what, again, you know, when you, when you reference uh, McCarrison, um you know, like I said, I want to I want to touch on that that initial paper, man, the fat hunter. If you can kind of briefly, right. I mean, when I was a kid growing up, I was fascinated looking at these sort of pictures of our pre 
uh, Homo sapien human ancestors. And a lot of people get confused about the term human. You know, they think humans are just Homo sapiens, but we have to realize that humans are everything with a, you know, Homo in front of their name, whether it's Homo erectus, Homo habilis, Homo heidelbergensis, right. and so on and so forth. And so when we talk about humans collectively, we're talking about the entire. Uh, evolution and as we see as more and more information gets released we're seeing more and more of this evolution is taking place outside of africa we're seeing more in the middle east even some in asia now so it's i think that right. the, the field is is evolving tremendously uh, the field right. of evolution is evolving which is kind of funny to say that but i mean it's very interesting to see that and so i know the the paper you you i mean we've got a couple to talk about but that one you, you talked about the area called the levant and can you talk about what is the levant for people that don't know what that is and then kind of talk a little bit about i know it focused on uh, homo erectus and you know what how they fueled themselves and, and what was going on what nutritional strategies made sense back then given what was around there and then we have to talk about climate because you know we we have to say what was what was going on climactically in that part of the world and that also drove what our options were can you can you go into that a little bit i know you i know that's a subject you're well versed in so if you don't mind sharing that with us right so maybe i will uh, uh, put a little personal things here uh when I, when i wrote that chapter that i talked about about nutrition i started eating a lot of fat and discarding carbohydrates. I don't think I was, uh, I, I'm not sure that I was ketogenic. At that time, I didn't really know what ketogenic was. Uh, but but I got so much uh, stamina, I didn't know what to do with it. I used to stand in my in my room and, and like, you know, uh, fighting, air, air fire, whatever you call that, yeah? I Shadow just boxing. didn't know, air boxing. <laughs> and that brought me I said, this must have been the initial conditions of humans, where who needs to go in, 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 the, in the savannas and hunt animals. So that draws my, my attention to fat. And uh, when I finished writing the book, which took about two years, I went back to a professor that I was uh, very impressed with in, in this archaeology department. And I gave him a copy of the book, and I told him, you know, uh, I think fat uh, drove evolution. They need to fat. I thought, uh, that was in the corridor, like just standing there. And I thought he would just laugh. But he immediately understood it and gave me a book that was written like maybe a few months ago by a, by a researcher, a very well-known researcher, John Speth, about fat and humans. Uh, paleo, paleo uh, humans. Uh, so I read the book and I realized that the need for fat stems from the fact that you eat a lot of uh, proteins. So anyway, to cut a long story short about, and then he invited me to, to participate in a seminar. So we, we remained in contact. And uh, about a few months later, they published uh, some teeth that they found in a site which is 15 kilometers away from Tel Aviv from 400,000 years ago that were no teeth of Homo erectus which is supposed to be around but the teeth that are much closer to Neanderthals and, and Homo sapiens uh, in, in, and teeth are, are very diagnostic because teeth you use it like thousands of times a day so they they uh, shaped, they are shaped differently if you eat differently, and they are very di diagnostic of, of species. So uh, I said to myself, okay, what happened? And then I connected one other thing. And this same professor asked in a seminar a few years before, you know, he said, I, I see that uh, Homo erectuses are... Uh, connected somehow with elephants every site that you get a homo erectus you can you can you you find uh, a, a, an elephant uh, remains and, and, and it's important to realize that homo erectus is the most successful human species ever they lived 1.5 million years and so they were the longest living humans that's Absolutely. interesting to say yeah a lot of people don't Absolutely. realize that it was yeah. a, it was really the a human being par excellence 
he had about, uh, started I think with 800 cc and ended up, you don't, I, I mean, you know, these, these numbers are a little uh, in, in debate, but uh, with about 1100 cc uh, brain. So I told him, you know, I know what happened. What, and, and then he asked the people, the, the students, you know, if you want to write something about it, what, what is the contact? What is the, the association between? What is the reason for that? So I told him I found the reason. The reason is that they needed these animals, these elephants, because they needed fat. And, uh, and he realized, he was the one who found out that elephants disappeared from the Levant. The Levant is, let's say, from northern uh, Lebanon to Israel, the south of Israel, and going to Jordan on, on, the, on the east. And then there's the sea on the west. But in Israel is a very interesting situation because it's like a cul-de-sac, where in the north you have the mountains between Israel and Lebanon. On the right, on the, on the east, you have the desert. On the west, you have the sea. And on the south, you have a desert. So elephants got extinct in Israel before they got extinct anywhere else in the world. Probably because of that. And today, I can tell you, and I, I will show you, I'll show you something about it, uh, that humans were responsible for it. No climate. Forget the climate. Uh, just overhunting. And, uh, but at that time, we didn't want to say it in the paper. We didn't know. So, we wrote that paper that associates the, the disappearance of elephants with their fat from the Levant and the, the, the evolution of a new species that could better cope with the smaller animals. Yeah, that was, you know, just to put it into perspective, you know, percentage-wise from an elephant is how much fat relative to protein compared to, say, something like a fallow deer or something else that might have been you know, hunted afterwards as far as, you know, how much fat were we getting? I know for me personally, I just feel better with a fat here cut of meat. And I, I suspect, you know, entrecote, you know, as you might say in French, or ribeye as we have in the U.S., scotch fillet, if you're in Australia, perhaps, it simulates elephant meat more to me than anything else out there. And so <laughs> what, what, what is the, uh, what was the, what was the nutritional breakdown of an elephant or a mammoth or, you know, Elephants are completely extinct, but we still have a few species left, but we've wiped out the mastodon, the mammoth, and all these other woolly rhinoceros and hip, big, you know, all these big animals were just, just just killed, presumably by humans. There are people that debate that it was climate, but I think there's pretty clear evidence wherever humans spread to throughout the world, whether it's Australia or North America or, or you know, the Pacific Islands, you know, we wiped out any big animals we came in contact with. And so what was a, what is the nutritional breakdown of an elephant? Okay, that's a good question. Nobody did the work. Nobody killed an elephant or, or, or went to an elephant that died and measured and weighed the, the fat uh, and, and the protein. But they did it to about 257 other animals. And it, this paper was published in 1968. And I was the... Uh, I took this paper and being an economist, I didn't have a problem of calculating the fat percentage of these 257 animals. And uh, there, is, there was a general rule which was very strong. Smaller animals contain less fat, relatively speaking, than larger animals. The largest animal there was a hippo. And they, that, that animal's fat was male 50, female like 60, 60% 60 fat in terms of calories. Now, <laughs> This 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 the little problem that people speak about fat in terms of uh, a weight per uh, 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 percentage weight per body mass. Okay, so so they come to like five percent or six percent. It sounds very low, but uh, you know, out of the out of the weight of an animal, uh, I think about seventy percent is water, and if you take off the bone and you take off the skin, uh, there is not much left. So even 5% can be 50% of the calories. And fat, of course, have more, two, two and a quarter more calories than protein. Now, this, this law, this general law, was found already before me. 
Uh, and there's even uh, like, like a formula that you can stick in the, the weight of the animal and get the fat content. Uh, so if hippo uh, at one and a half ton had the 60%, 50% animal fat, I don't know what an, what, a, what, a, what an elephant would have, but it probably had as much or maybe even more. Yeah, so I think we're dealing with a high fat animal. That's a very important point that people don't realize. You know, that, right. yeah, mo we're mostly made out of water, all creatures, mammals, and, and then you got to take out the skeleton, and then you get the actual sort of weight of what's going on. And so, yeah, we are quite a bit more fat by uh, calorie. If You know, we're you know why, why it's so important, I think we, we didn't really discuss it. Why it's so important is because protein consumption is limited. You cannot consume more than... You know, there is a debate about it, and nobody is going to take human beings and run, you know, feed them uh, protein until they die, and then, then this, we know what it is. But, but, but it's about 35 to 45% of, of the calories. So you're talking about 300 grams a day for a normal person. Yeah, and that's that's quite a bit. That's based on, I think, what you're talking about, some of the anthropologic evidence. Uh, and certainly, that's much more than most people eat today. I, I, I eat that much because I, I eat mo just just a diet, and so I eat plenty of protein, and I do fine with that. I've even eaten as high as five, six hundred grams in a day with no ill effect whatsoever. And we've had other people on Ted Naiman on last week to talk about that. We'll have Stuart Phillips coming on in the near future to talk about some of those. Talk about this is another thing that you touched upon in the was about efficiency of energy output versus calories obtained strategies you know can you gather enough fruits and and uh, uh, starches and tubers how much energy expenditure is required to do that versus how much it takes to kill you know perhaps eat an, uh, an elephant or perhaps a smaller animal can you talk a little bit about the comparison there yeah okay so uh, humans need uh, about 2,500 calories, and by the way, uh, and this is uh, Herman Ponzer's uh, findings that I want to talk about as well. Uh, it doesn't change much. It's not. It's not like uh, women, a uh, human can spend 5,000 calories if they if they work harder. It's not like that. There is a limit. Uh, the the total uh, uh, energetic expenditure is uh, regulated. So it's about 2,500. Now, for hunter gatherers. Now, uh, and an that, elephant, and an that, elephant that, contains over a million, yeah. oh, million and a half calories. Yeah, just back to that earlier point, 2,500 calories. That's that's a certain body size, I assume, for for a, for a normal hunter gatherer size human, which would be 70 kilos. How big would they be? 70 kilos, maybe. Yes, something like that. Yes, yeah. Yes, so yes, like a bigger yes. human. Might might need more though. Yeah, it could be, uh, but it's not much more. It's a BMR. There's a BMR, the basic uh, metabolic rate, which is a function of body size. And then there's the locomotion. Most of the other expense is actually locomotion. So if you have a 1,700 uh, calories uh, BMR, the rest is what seven. Uh, 800 uh, calories for locomotion. Uh, so anyway, let's go back to the to the size of the animals and the fat situation. Uh, an, a, an elephant could last a group of 30 people, maybe two months. Uh, a buffalo can last for several weeks. So. Uh, if you compare that with uh, getting food from, uh, you know, digging uh, one and a half meter in the ground to get some uh, tuber, uh, that's ridiculous. So, so uh, in terms of being an economist, in terms of uh, return on, on, on time invested, the, I think the, the, they're talking about large animals, and these are large animals after the megafauna extinction because they take the data, data from... Uh, Ethnography. You're talking about 65,000 kilojoule per hour of working, compared to about 6,000 kilojoule for tubers. So this is the return. 
Now, if the women has nothing to do, have nothing to do, they go around and they pick some fruit and some and fruit. Of course, they compete with the monkeys. They, uh, you know, animals don't wait for for humans to come and pick up the fruit. So, in any case, uh, um, animals are much, much more uh, economical to 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 collect. And you need you need to be economical because you have a limited uh, expenditure. Uh, energy, uh, energetic expansion. What, what yeah, do we? Need? Oh, sorry, Sean. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm just no, go curious, ahead, like especially when we were looking at like some of these bigger creatures, like elephants and hippopotamus and things like that. Do we have like a good idea of what uh, these these hunters were doing to kind of preserve these big kills for a long enough period of time? Because uh, I think most people listening are thinking, well, if I if I even kill a deer, I need a deep freeze in order to keep that you know fresh enough so what, what were people doing back then to like if they killed an elephant to to make sure that that meat was still okay you know 45 60 days down the road mm. uh, th there's no there's no direct uh, evidence for what they did uh what what we can do is learn from uh, uh, ethnography mainly uh there's a for instance uh a tribe, Aka, lives in the Congo forest, and they they hunt uh, elephants from time to time, and they just dry the meat. Mm -hmm. uh, there are uh, there was just a paper by John Spethers again about uh, eating. Uh, I'm not sure of the word. Protrude, protruded, meat like meat oh, that is rotten. Putrid. Put Future. Okay. Yeah. The problem for me is that I just read these let these words. I don't never I never hear them. So uh, this is a common practice of eating this you know uh, rotten meat, especially in the north northern uh, territories. There is a case in the U.S. in Michigan that they found uh, an elephant buried in a hole. And and I think the hole was still filled with water. I'm not sure, but but the the interpretation was that this was a way to preserve because if you keep something in water, and there's no oxygen. You can preserve it for quite a while. The other thing that happens with the with the aka is that once a group uh, get hold of an elephant, everybody gets to know that, and you you got like a hundred people around in no time. So there's a lot of sharing going on with, you know, between among hunter gatherers. So this is this is another solution to that problem. What well, Mickey? What was the? Uh, you you mentioned thirty people. My understanding is humans typically clustered in in groups of a dozen, maybe two dozen. Typically, that was a typical kind of clustering. You know, back in you know archaic humans. And then how did they kill these elephants? Because we Neanderthals is thought that they have not. Well, a projectile technology, probably just standing there, hearing them. Modern humans developed atlatls where they could throw from a distance. Uh, but how did these Homo erectus or some of these early sort of hybrids that, that kind of came from Homo erectus and, and moved into the Homo sapien type of, I think you call them Achillean, Jabrudian? Like right, Achillean, yeah. Achillean, yeah, based on the, on, the, on the rock technology. But how did they kill these animals? Because, you know, a big elephant is, you know, I've been down to Africa and I've seen these elephants. And the neat thing about elephants, they're so big, they don't run away. You know, right. they, when they when they are faced with a predator like a lion who might go after their babies, they just turn and face as a group. And so I would assume that's how their strategy would be to deal with humans. They don't run away like a deer where you have to chase. So now you've got this big, you know, 12,000 pound animal in front of you did they was there any evidence of projectile technology back then or how did how did they kill those animals and if it if so you know i assume there was a point you know there's a group of, of mammoth hunters called the gravedians who were very efficient at killing mammoth and so there was at some point the technology evolved where they got good at it and once you got good at it i don't think elephants were that necessarily hard to track or find and so i think they probably had plenty of available nutrition for them which would help them to uh, develop you know as a species yeah, yeah, that's a, <laughs> it's a misconception that it's difficult to hunt an animal, uh, an elephant. Uh, there are several ways that are described in the literature, in et ethnographic literature, of how uh, Africans kill animals, uh, large animals. 
and especially elephants. Uh, and there was a guy, a, a researcher, a very brilliant researcher named Churchill, who collected all this information about how to hunt, how, how uh, you know, present-day uh, tribes hunt all kinds of animals. And it turns out that to hunt, in order to hunt a very large animal, the first thing you have to do is to limit their, their uh, locomotion or their, their mobility. And there are several ways of doing it. Uh, you can drive them into a mud. You can drive them into a canyon. Uh, you can uh, set up, you know, a hole in the ground, a, a pit. A, a, yeah, it's a pit, right? Pit, yeah. Like, uh, 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 and disguise it. Uh, and, and that's the only thing you have to do. Once you did that, they are done. Because you, you, you can use even uh, wooden spears to kill animals, to kill elephants. Uh, they uh, harden the, the edge of the spear with uh, some uh, fire. And for instance, in uh, Laringen, in Germany, uh, uh, archaeologists found spears that are 300 years old and these are wooden spears they were again preserved in water they were they were, they were in water and uh, they were used there to hunt horses mainly so uh, yeah you can kill an animal uh, the aka for instance <laughs> what they do is j they just need two people what they go in pairs and one gets behind and cut the thing with uh, the tendon behind the knee of the elephant, okay, which you can do today with metal, but I don't think it was could have been done before. And then the the other one comes in the front, hit him in the nose, and just it just bleeds to death. Uh, with all these pits, with all there's uh, another system, uh, method is like they have um, heavy uh, wood. That they put on top and they wait for the elephant to come and then they drop it on their on their head when when they so there, there are enough ways and it's not so difficult uh, what he found churchill is that the bow and arrow which you talk about actually is uh, is for hunting uh, a fleeting animal okay more smaller animals and this is what happens one of the proof that they were going after smaller and smaller animals is that the bow and arrow actually developed maybe 80,000 years ago at the most. Before that, there, weren't, there wasn't bow and, bow and arrow. There was no need for it. People said they were stupid. No, I don't think they were stupid. They just didn't need it. And by the way, they didn't need more than a wooden spear to kill large, large animals. Later on, about 300,000 years ago, the, you had the spear, you had the, like a, a, a stone uh, tip that uh, goes on a spear. And that uh, is really for if you want to throw the spear. But uh, before, if you want to use a wooden spear, uh, it's, it's actually a thrusting spear. So you can get as close as possible to that animal because you've, you've limited the mobility and you just thrust it into the animal. Now, if you thrust it into the animal, you, you don't want to have a stone uh, tip because it breaks. So you can Pressed it only once, and the next second time it's already bland. So, so really, it's not such a big problem. That's fascinating, and you know, it's kind of interesting because you know the Neanderthal same thing. You know, they they I think were thought to have mostly thrusting technology, and uh, as we know, the Neanderthal brain was even hum larger than the uh, modern Homo sapien brain. Can you talk a little bit now? We've got this quest for fat. You know, we've got this you right. know, this kind of establishment that man was trying to get as many calories as as as, as possible. You can do that gathering uh, tubers and maybe eating fruits, depending where you are. But that's not very efficient, and so we we turn to these big fatty animals, which ultimately are not that difficult to kill, as we discover that. And then the megafauna extinction extinction happens. You know, we either we we drove them to death. You know, some again, some people say climate contributed to that, but however it happened, it happened. And then what happened? So then, then what's going on? How did humans evolve after that? What, what, what was driving our evolution after that? And, what, and how did that play out? Okay. Now, there is a misconception that the 
uh, megafauna extinction, which happened about 60, 50,000 years ago, started, ended about 10,000 years ago. Uh, that was the major event that uh, drove down the size of uh, animals. Uh, but this is absolutely not true, not not the case. And but it was it wasn't discovered until very very recently. There's I think a 1918 uh, paper by uh, uh, Elia. No 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 no. I wrote down the name. Oh, po, po, po. Felicia Smith and uh, and uh, associates. Yeah, she's out of the University of New Mexico. I, I saw that. I want to you try know to get her? her. I don't know her, but I'm trying to get a hold of her to get her on the show, maybe too. I know she wrote a paper about megafaunal extinction, so that might be fun to I talk to. I tell you, these 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 people, I think they are associated with Washington, with the uh, Institute of something. Anyway, uh, she tracked the size, the average size of mammals. Okay. Uh, Starting 65 billion, uh, sorry, million years ago, right when the when the dinosaurs uh, went extinct, and that size grew gradually, gradually over 62 and a half million years, from close to one kilo average. Now that's if you take all the species and you just average them out. Yeah, it's not like you count the number of animals, but just the species. By two, by two and a half million years ago, it reached 500 kilos. 500 kilo was the average. That's tremendous. That's huge. Yeah. <laughs> huge. Huge. There were so many large species to uh, balance all the, uh, you know, the mice and all the smaller uh, mammals, right, to reach an average of 500 kilos. Okay. Today, it's 10. In other words, in two and a half million years, it went down from 500 kilos to 10 kilos. And about uh, 120 so years in Africa, it was already 100 kilos. So it went down from 500 kilos uh, over about two million years to about 100 kilos. So the, the extinction started long, long time ago, and that's why I'm I think that it had nothing to do with climate whatsoever. It had everything to do with humans. Uh, there's another researcher, uh, Swedish guy, I forgot the name, uh, maybe I remember later. Uh, he did a study of the uh, uh, population of carnivores uh, two, two million years ago or so. And he found out that about, by about one and a half million years ago, the large, some of the large carnivores of Africa disappeared or went extinct, whereas the smaller carnivore didn't. And his conclusion is that actually what happened is that humans competed with these large carnivores and took their place in the carnivore guild. So the evidence starts to accumulate. No, the, the weather, you know, there's always weather, but uh, <laughs> it's humans. Uh, if you if you see the graph, it's unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, there there were uh, some of the critics of the climate theory say there were many many ice ages and climate changes all through that time, and it was not until humans reached a critical mass and expanded throughout the world that we saw this dramatic loss of these megafaunal animals. And I think that, you know, there's some people, I know there's some people that say that there was a huge comet that hit North America that was responsible for the North American metal extinction. I think that's controversial. Do uh, you have any insight on that event or any insight into people that talk about that that particular instance? You, you, I didn't hear well. You're talking about North America? Yeah, North America. There are people that say that a large asteroid or comet hit cause a significant uh, climate incident which was responsible for much of the North American megafaunal die-off. And, and I don't know if that's consistent with what archaeology shows or uh, maybe it was an isolated area for that this particular area. I tell you, there is a big bias in the, in the archaeological uh, faunal record uh, that stems from the fact that you kill uh, like 
say elephants or mastodons, uh, you kill them one by one and you don't bring them, all of them, to the a central place. When you kill, a, when you kill a, a, an elephant, you just take the meat, you take the fat, and you, 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 you either stay there or, or you go. But the, the remains are just one elephant. Uh, normally, uh, in, in archaeological sites, you find many animals because this is a place where, where, where they brought or they butchered the animal in another place and then they brought the parts that they wanted, by the way, the fatty parts mostly, uh, uh, to a central place. So you don't find, it just by sheer, uh, uh, you know, uh, statistics, uh, uh, fluke, that you don't find many uh, elephants or, or, or proboscideans that uh, were, were, you know, butchered. Also, there are no signs on the bones because the bones are covered with, uh, you will know better the name of the thing that what, what, what cover bones, uh, it's like a, a membrane. Yeah, periosteum. A tough membrane. Yeah, it's called the periosteum. Periosteum, right. It's very thick in animals. So if you cut the meat, you don't go, you, don't, you rarely go through the periosteum. So do you don't find, uh, on, the, on the bone itself, you don't find uh, what they call cut marks, which you do in other animals. So in any case, this is a, a, a bias. But if you take what they did find, they found in the U.S. Elephant, I don't remember the name of the species, mammoth or, or mastodon, with uh, actually um, a tip of uh, of uh, of uh, arrow inside the inside the bone. So, and by the way, they never actually want to hit the bone. If you hit the bone, it's not very effective. So you don't find a lot in the bones because this is the aim at places where you don't have a lot of bones. So anyway, it's a statistical uh, si uh, situation. And I don't, I don't believe the climate had anything to do with it. So just a, a quick question on that, like, because I think like the proponents of like asteroidal impact or comet impact causing these, you know, big megafauna to die off, like part of their like argument, if I'm remembering correctly, is that we find these kind of mass graveyards. And so are you saying that that could potentially be more so just because these these groups of uh, hunters were just bringing all that stuff back to these central locations, and then over time we have this big buildup of remains. I think you say that for the smaller animals, Zach, but for the elephants, because they were so huge, they just kind of camped around the elephant until it was done. Is, is that what I'm kind of understanding, Mickey? Yeah, the elephant, they would either camp around the elephant or just butcher it and take the meat and the fat and leave the bones there. Okay. So you won't find the, the, the bones in the central place. Sure. Normally, for instance, in Neanderthals, all these mammoth uh, remains in Neanderthals are mainly teeth. Uh, I don't know why they brought the teeth. There could be a reason. But uh, you, you rarely find other, other parts of, of the... Oh, it just doesn't make sense. They're too heavy. Hmm. <laughs> There's no way they can bring them. So... Uh, and I, another point, maybe, if we're talking about America and South America, is the naivety of the animals. And this is a well-known fact, that when you come into an area where, where humans were not there, the animals just are not afraid of humans. And it's very easy to, to hunt them. And uh, as, as the case is, the, after the megafauna extinction, the Americas, both of them, has the lowest average number, ever average weight of species. Uh, South America even even lower than North America. So this naivety uh, just helped the hunters. It was no big problem to hunt. Let me uh, ask you about um, the, uh, you know, so humans, how old are humans? I mean, you know, you, you look at some of the research, not when I say humans, when I say, I say homo sapiens, because you know, if you look at stuff like Omo One out of, I think it's out of Ethiopia, where they, where they kind of dated to humans to around 195,000 years ago. But then they found some stuff in Morocco that maybe puts it back to 300,000. And now we're saying maybe I've seen some some like different technology. You know, they looked at, look, used to look at the Oldowan technology and then the Ashulean technology. And they saw some stone tools 
consistent with human homo sapien technology even as far back as 500,000 years ago. So do we have an idea of when the homo, speci homo sapien species actually emerged and where that happened? You see, this is uh, one of the problems with uh, trying to call names, uh, species, to something that is gradual. Uh, you know, people don't share species, uh, uh, Homo erectus to Homo sapiens, if they indeed followed each other, which is also not true. Uh, uh, you know, they take uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, years to to grow from one species to another. So when when do you call a species a species? Uh, so yeah, you're right. It was 200, and now uh, they found this uh, uh, skull in, in uh, I think it's called the pigeon uh, cave in in Morocco. Oh no, it's called another. It's, it has another name. Pigeon cave is something else. Uh, so they found this 300 years old uh, skull that they think is, you know, is uh, Homo sapiens. Of course, other people debate that and that, etc., etc. Uh, unfortunately, in uh, Kesem Cave, which is the cave where we, where uh, my my uh, professors found the teeth, uh, they didn't find the skull, but they did find the skull in another cave in Israel. And that skull has, from the same uh, culture period, uh, nobody sure about the age exactly, but that culture lasted from 400 to 200,000 years ago. So that skull shows the same attributes, the same, it's like between Neanderthals and, and Homo sapiens. And these, you're talking about a culture that started 400,000 years ago and was very advanced uh, compared to the to the previous culture, uh, so yeah, so so uh, you know. Uh, by the way, they just also in 2017, the end of 2017 or 2018, uh, a paper was published about uh, from uh, the researchers called Richard Potts, uh, a site in Africa. And that was a, 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 that, that demonstrates a change in culture from a Shalian to what they call in Africa the Middle Stone Age. Uh, in, in Africa, there's Early Stone Age, Middle Stone Age, and Late Stone Age. And the Middle Stone Age, and they found that there is a reduction in the size of animals. In other words, the same phenomenon that we've identified in the Levant where a reduction in the size of animals brought a new culture has happened 300,000 years ago in Africa. And, you know, it ties up very well with the 300,000 years ago uh, skull that they found in, in Morocco. So this is why I'm now writing a paper about a general theory of, of human evolution uh, that will include, you know, more places in the world, not just not just uh, the Levant. Let me let me ask you uh, one question, and then I'll, then then I want to talk about the protein stuff because I know you you talked about protein. What was so as these you know large animals died off, and then then the species here, whatever we're going to call ourselves at that point, you know it, something in between, Homo erectus, Neanderthal, you know Homo sapien, is faced with this relative dearth of large animals. What were the evolutionary adaptations that took place to, 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 to change us into what we are now, Homo sapiens? Okay. So, uh, maybe because I, I, my, my background is in, economic, in economics, I look at everything uh, from the point of view of energy. Uh, because energy is the currency of life. And uh, it's limited. And you have to allocate it. So, the, if you look at the size, at the, at the percentage fat in animals, it goes like that. It's about 50% uh, with animals up to about 200 kilos. And then it goes down quite dramatically to about 30%, 35%. And it makes sense because animals below 200 kilos, they are, their escape is, is the main strategy. 
Uh, so they don't want to pack too much uh, fat. Although, of course, fat is, is you know, will, will give them a better chances to survive. So when the, when the size of animals go down to that level, and I'm not talking about all the animals, but you, you have to, let's say the larger animal becomes scarcer. And you need to get the same amount of calories and the same amount of fat or the same percentage of fat from smaller animals, you have an energetic problem because these smaller animals, they don't wait for you. You have to follow them. You have to find them. Large animals don't care. They live like heaps of, uh, you know, of, <laughs> you know, an elephant live heaps mm. of whatever you want to call it uh, 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 and, and, and traces all over the place. He doesn't care because he's big. Smaller animals even try to hide their their uh, traces by walking sometimes on 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 rocky areas. They're so they're so uh, uh, aware of it. In any ways, in any way, it's very difficult to uh, to track smaller animals and very energy consuming. Like we said, the locomotion is the main uh, component of uh, energetics beside the basic metabolic rate. So you want to cut on locomotion. In order to cut on locomotion, you have to trace, you have to know how to trace animals. And in order to trace animals, you need a large brain. You need to know everything that you can about nature. I'll just give you a small example. Let's say you go and you find a trace of a certain animal. Now you want to know whether to pursue it or not. And uh, you see uh, a small traces of very, very small animal or, or, or an insect that walked, you know, on these tracks. Now if you can identify these, these small tracks and, and, you, and you know that this is a nocturnal insect, you know that these track this animal track was made in the in the in during the night so if you're there in the noon it's already too late mm -hmm. so you have to know just a small example how much they knew about nature it is unbelievable they they know and and this is in ethnographic uh, uh, you, you can you can also uh, uh, know it from an ethnographic uh, record they know everything they know what animal eat. They know what, how they think. They know how they mate. They know when they mate. They know just about everything. And for that, you need a lot of memory. You need also to pull out the information at a very short time. And this also demands quite a, like, quite a large brain or a specially set up brain. So it demands on the brain that actually uh, with a larger brain, you can track better and you can save on locomotion. And also, if you, if you look at the Homo sapiens, he's got a better uh, adaptation for mobility in longer legs and, uh, you know, all this uh, Lieberman uh, persistent hunting uh, evolution. You know, he's got like, what, 22 different uh, signs of, uh, that he interpreted as an uh, adaptation to running. Yeah, that was actually... So this, oh, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. I was just, I had a couple kind of questions that you kind of started to answer. And um, one of them had to do with like the brain size. And I think a lot of times people just think like as humans have, you know, kind of progressed, our brains have just gotten bigger. But it looks like from what a lecture I watched of yours that if you look at it in a timeline, you actually see growth and reduction over time. Uh, and one thing you had mentioned I thought that was very interesting goes right along the lines of what you were just talking about where just like the intellectual capacity required to know all the information to uh, track these smaller animals required a bigger brain. And then once uh, you find groups of humans who are relying more on agriculture, maybe just due to scarcity of, of hunting prey, uh, there's a reduction because the intellectual stimulus of kind of learning how to plant a crop and just doing that over and over again is much lower. You don't need to know nearly as much. You just kind of have to follow the seasons and then hope a famine doesn't come. Is that kind of, uh, am I kind of describing accurately what you've been, what you're trying to explain? Yep. Uh, 
The only problem with that theory is that uh, agriculture started about 10,000 10, years ago, and this brain reduction, size reduction, started about 20, 25,000 years ago. Nobody knows exactly. Uh, but, but what happens is uh, when you look at the archaeological record, you see that uh, the reliance on, uh, on plant food uh, started a higher reliance on, on plant food started about 25, 30, 40 years ago. Yeah. 40 years ago, start the Upper Paleolithic. And in my PhD, I showed that the Upper Paleolithic actually is a, a, a culture that is more adapted to deal with plants, more plants. And now I'm not talking about 50% plants. I don't think they, they did that. I, I don't know exactly what the ratio was, but... but uh, I think my feeling is it went from 10% to maybe 30%. Hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's, Mickey, there's a lot of, uh, you know, isotope data out there, particularly out of Europe, that shows that, that human beings, uh, whether Homo sapiens, you know, or early, early modern Homo sapiens, or perhaps Neanderthal, were very carnivorous, approaching that of other predators like wolves and, and things like that. And so certainly, it's very interesting, because I've always been told that, you know, you can tell the difference between a farmer and a hunter-gatherer, anthropologically, based on their skeleton. You know, their skeletons tend to be smaller, more frail if they were farmers. And, and then again, their, their endocranium size was, was much smaller. And so we lost about 200 cc's of brain. But it's interesting you say that that started, you know, at the beginning of the Upper Paleolithic at 25 years ago, which coincides with more and more reliance on on plants. As again, as these bigger animals started to die off, and so it was an, it right. was basically a, a forced strategy to deal with the loss of energy. And now we have a situation where uh, we don't have an issue with energy anymore. <laughs> we have too much energy in the modern diet, unfortunately, but it's not helped our our overall health in any way. And so the reliance on um, you know, heavy meat reliance, heavy animal fat reliance is what sort of allowed these people that preceded us, you know, 50,000 years ago to, th to thrive and to have the largest brain capacity that, that, are, that, are, that the human species has seen. And so I think that's kind of fascinating. I know I, I must tell you, they don't take this plant business to, 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 to a, an extreme. They did use more plants. You see it from the stone tools and, and many other ways. But how do you know that they were still very, very carnivorous? And that is because they were crazy for fat. They did fat, they, 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 they were boiling bones, okay, to get the fat out of bone. Now, bone contain about 6% of the fat in an animal. Boiling bones to get the fat out is a big business. I mean, this is, uh, there's a book by a fellow named Brinks about uh, Alberta, a, a, a tribe in Alberta. He, he reconstructed their, their way. And, and they, were, they were extracting fat from bones uh, to produce uh, pemmican. And they were breaking the bones. He, he, he was an ecologist. So he found the bones broken. And he found the, the stones Okay, that used to used in the boiling. Okay, they heat the stones and then they put it in like a they, they dig a hole, they cover it with the uh, skin, and then they fill it with water and, and throw in this uh, hot uh, stones. So uh, he found these stones broken. Okay, because these stones break after a while. You heat them, you cool them, you heat them, you cool them. They they break. So they had to go further and further away to get the stones. And then he tried some experiments. So he took this Indian la lady, Blackfoot, I think, was the name of the tribe. And uh, she was in charge of breaking the bones. And she got covered with fat. And she, she just worked. And, and at the end of the day, she told him, look, I don't know how they did it, but they certainly didn't do it this way. <laughs> so... So, <laughs> just standing up and trying to break bones is not an easy job. And they did it. So, really, and I'm not the one saying it, it's Otram. There's another researcher who said that it's a sure sign that they were, they were just desperate for fat. Now, if you have enough 
if you have enough plants, you don't need fat. I mean, you, you need fat, of course, and all that stuff. But but you don't need, you don't need uh, such a large quantities of fat that you have to go to the bones. And so for me, it means that they were always, always on, and this is important for the protein discussion, always on the limit of protein consumption. In other words, I think that humans throughout evolution were at about 30, 35 percent at least of the calories from protein. And this is shown by the fact that fat, there was just, there were just, inf I don't remember the word, infatuated? Yeah, infatuated was fat. And you can see it throughout the prehistory. So if you're infatuated with fat, it means that you are on the brink, on the on the limit of protein, because otherwise protein is is easy to get. By the way, any animal will give you protein, but not uh, not any animal will give a fat. Yeah, again, that makes sense. You know, fat being such a wonderful, rich source of energy, and I think it's all about energy. We're we're, we're not, you know, back then they weren't thinking about micronutrients, they weren't thinking about vitamins and minerals. They were thinking about how do I get enough energy to survive, and I think that. Right. Is, is clearly what what they were after, you know. Um, protein, you know, there were some there. I, I know, you know, we had Ted Naiman on the show the other day, Dr. Ted Naiman. He talked about that the current U.S. diet indicates we get about 12 percent of our calories from protein, which is woefully an abysmal amount compared to what you're saying our species evolved, which which I think is 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 telling. And I think, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of people that are that are saying that, uh, you know, we need more protein. And there's a lot of people that are against that. But I think this evolutionary argument certainly points to a higher protein type of uh, requirement, or at least a situation which we which we sort of adapted to and thrived in. Can you talk about some of the physical adaptations that occurred for protein? I know we talk. I know in one of your papers you talked about the changes in the size of the the intrapelvic di diameter, uh, things like that to, to accommodate larger organs like the kidneys and, and, and liver and so on and so forth. Yeah, this, this is with the Neanderthals. It's a, it's a, the Neanderthal chest is different than ours. We have like a barrel shape where it gets uh, a little narrower at the end, right, at the, at the bottom. Uh, Neanderthals have the exact opposite. They have like a bell shaped. And at the bottom, part is wider, is getting wider. Now, the, the pre prevalent uh, theory was that they needed more space for their lungs to breathe. But uh, I looked at it and I look at the, uh, it's not my business, uh, anatomy, but I looked, of course, you can get anything on the internet today. So I looked at the picture and I'm seeing that actually at that area where the, where the chest or where the uh, ribs become larger, actually this is where, where the liver is. It's not where the lungs are. I don't, I, I've never done it and I, I don't know how to do it and I hope that they will do it. I've never measured the lung capacity, uh, presumed lung capacity of Neanderthals compared to humans. I don't think it's that different. Especially because they hunt large animals and they don't need uh, they don't have really much higher energetic needs than, than Homo sapiens who, are, who hunt smaller animals. So this business with the, with the Neanderthals needing like, there are some estimates 5,000, 4,000 calories a day. I don't believe in that. But in any case. So I, I just said, told it to, to my professor. I told him, I think this is where uh, the liver is because they consumed a lot of... Uh, protein and and this uh, gluconeogenesis taking place in the liver and so they needed a large liver okay so that was fine and we left it at that like maybe a year later he sends me an article about uh, the Eskimos and it turns out that these Eskimos when they were first met had an enlarged liver uh, something megaly I'm not sure what the what the Professional, uh, yeah, it would be called hepat hepatomegaly. Is hepatomegaly, that's it. Right, uh, and that's important. And and they were drinking copious water. By the way, these guys could eat like uh, I think nine kilos in in a meal, something like that. Unbelievable. <laughs> and uh, so I said, oh, okay, here I have it. 
And I started, I looked at the literature and I found some studies with the rats. And the rats also get a large liver and kidneys when they, when they eat uh, a, lot, a lot of protein. So that was that. That was the, the, the theory why uh, Neanderthals have a bell-shaped chase, chest and why they uh, ate a lot of protein. Do you think that the Neanderthals stuck to the to the upper limit of human at, at about 35%, 35-40%, or do you think they might? No, no, they were about 50, I think 50. You know, maybe you could actually calculate it based on the difference in the size of the, presumed difference in the size of the livers. I never went into this. I'm not a biologist. Uh, although, I must say that I'm very... Uh, uh, I regret not not being a bio, not not going to study biology because the evidence for what I actually uh, interested in and this is how uh, carnivorous are we? Uh, I found it in biology more than in archaeology. So I just give you an example. You know, you you will know that uh, the pH age of our stomach is 1.5 right it's yeah, very right, yeah. Yeah, very it's, very acid uh, yeah that's what most of the most of the studies uh, tend to indicate about one one to 1.1 1. 1 to 1. 1.5 right so, one, one when we start to eat is going down to one so uh, this uh, researcher uh, Di Diana Beasley uh, started to compare acidity among Carnivores, omnivores, uh, scavengers, and herbivores. So the, the acidity of herbivores, of uh, herbivores, I'm not interested. It, it, it's anyway, it's, it's not very acid. But carnivores are around three, four. We are around one point five. We are scavengers. This was the lowest, the lowest pH that she found in any animal. She's, I think she's investigated some 50. Now she says in, in the paper that uh, to her, in her opinion, this means that we were uh, uh, scavengers. But if you go back to the size of animals and you realize that you have animals that you can consume over 10 days, 20 days, you need that capacity to fight pathogens uh, without being a scavenger. So here, here you have a proof that we were carnivores because uh, evolving to retain such high acidity is a big business. You, you, have, uh, you spend a lot of energy uh, producing that acidity. You spend a lot of energy coating the, the stomach for, to, to deal with that acidity. So here's one you know, little uh, example and there are quite a few if you go into biology, genetics, morphology, uh, all kinds of... Uh, I found like 20, 12 different things like that. Okay, this one is the strongest one, I must admit. The other are, require some interpretation, etc. Uh, you find your, your proof for carnivory there. Yeah, it's interesting because I, you know, I've, I'm aware of the, the the theory that you know we evolved as scavengers due to due to that low gastric pH. But it's very interesting you bring up that point that we were killing these big animals, and then our preservation techniques were either sticking it underwater, sticking it in the ice, or drying it out in the sun. And 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 certainly, you know, when it's exposed to air, you're going to have a higher number of pathogens. There's some people that like to call that high meat you know there's 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 a there's a thought yeah. that people like to eat this fermented meat which right. would be which would be covered in pathogens and so we have this and you're absolutely right a, a very energetic gener energetically expensive process to generate all those hydrochloric ions or hydrochloric acid uh, molecules and, and then the mucus to, to coat the stomach to protect yourself cells and so there, there had to have been a reason to drive that and, and I certainly can see where you're you know having these animals with all that extra meat laying around that we if we continue to do that that would support that I think that's fascinating can you here's an, just another a little offshoot here talk about the use of fire. Do, we know, do we have a good idea when we put that in I mean Homo to have fire uh, under control or was it not until we had homo sapiens and did it take because there's some thought that you know 
harvesting fire and cooking meat and possibly cooking starches are what evolved our brain? Or did our brain have to evolve in order to control fire first? So I think there's a, there's a fine point around that. Can you discuss anything about what we know about the, about the origins of controlled fire usage for cooking? Uh, this is a big uh, debate uh, that I have with uh, Rangam. I don't think that he has it with me because I don't know how much he knows about my work. Uh, and I haven't really published anything on it. But uh, he claims that Homo erectus, uh, large brain, was needed to control fire. Because uh, without fires, Without fire, we couldn't chew. That was one of his arguments. It takes such a long time to chew. And he's, he's actually a primatologist. He, 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 he studied uh, chimpanzees. I think he replaced Gene Goodell. Uh, and he's very distinctive, very well-known scientist from Harvard. Uh, and I have much admiration for him. Uh, but he published a theory there is very, very little evidence for use of fire and uh, habitual use of fire. Maybe a fire here and a fire there, but habitual use of fire can only be found about 400,000 years ago. And you're talking about uh, Homo erectus starting, what, 1.5 million years ago, 1.7, 1.8 million years ago. So you're talking about one, 1 1.2 million years well, there's very little evidence for fire. But not only that, there, there, there's, for instance, in Israel, but there are other, other places as well, there's a cave, Taboon Cave, where you have the residues for, for, for about 8,000 years, 800,000 years. Okay, the first, uh, I think it's 400,000 years, there's nothing, no signs of fire, and then it starts. So... And by the way, today, uh, recent studies uh, showed that Neanderthals use fire on and off. They didn't always use fire. For a long periods of time, uh, 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 surprisingly enough, when it was cold, they didn't use fire. My private little theory is that they, there wasn't a lot of wood. Uh, Collecting wood is an energy, energetically expensive uh, uh, enterprise. But anyway, so, so that's the first thing. Uh, and then, uh, about a year ago, uh, Lieberman, Zink and Lieberman, uh, from Harvard as well, that, that's Lieberman from the uh, persistent hunting uh, theory, uh, did an experiment uh, about how, how long it takes to chew raw meat. And the mere fact that you cut the meat to small pieces cut the time by an order of magnitude. So their conclusion was that you didn't, not, you didn't need uh, any fire to get this. Because you, uh, the, the, the thing with the chewing is, is uh, evident from the size of the, of the mandible and all that stuff, and then the teeth. So the, in Homo erectus already, and this is why Homo erectus to me is, is, is a hunter, 100% hunter, uh, because the, the size of the teeth and the size of the jaw and the muscles uh, in the jaw uh, are much, much smaller than uh, his predecessor. Yeah, it's, when you talk about primates, it's very interesting because if you look at, you know, say for say gorillas, for instance, they spend of their waking hours about eighty percent of that time is spent chewing. Right. Chimpanzees spend spend something around about sixty five percent of their waking hours just chewing constantly mm -hmm. to get to get their protein requirements. And then, uh, but then I I saw some evidence. I'm not sure how they determined it, but they estimated, you know, s some of the early humans. And I'm not sure which species they were looking at, but they estimated only about four percent of their day was that dedicated to chewing and basically made, that might have been based on jaw anatomy but that that is very telling and, and you know assuming they had tools back then and I think we can go back even as far as Australopithecus and say that those guys were using tools and so uh, we've been tool users for That's debatable 
Yeah, I mean, that's debatable. And whether they made the tools or use them, we know that chimpanzees can utilize right. tools. There are those animals that utilize tools, but whether they actually fashion them, you know, and flake them or not. But certainly once we had Homo habilis, I guess that's our definition of humanity is we, we, right. we start. The definition right. of a human, my understanding, is, is someone who makes tools. We're the tool maker. And I think that's right. one of the In my findings. opinion, uh, Homo habilis was also an Australopithecus. But, okay, but this is a, like a private opinion. Sure. Not shared by other people as well. But, but like I said, when we have tools, then we can cut the meat into smaller pieces, and then we can probably get by with a smaller, less powerful jaw and be much more efficient at processing all that high amounts of energy, particularly with the fat. Fat is not that hard to chew, typically. No. <laughs> you can say that again. <laughs> well, yeah, you, there's that phrase, chewing the fat, but I don't think fat is that hard to chew. But, you know, maybe maybe it is. I don't know. Mickey, what else do you want to talk about? We've had you. This has been so. I tell you, I'm like a kid in a candy store listening to all this stuff because I'm so fascinated about the uh, the evolution of, of man and, and all that stuff. You know, you wish we had a time machine so we could fly back there and see. I know that uh, you know a lot of the criticisms about uh, uh, evolution is that their fossil record is not that robust. We've only got you know a limited amount of skeletons and, and very few full skeletons, a few teeth here, a few jaw bones, some some uh, skulls once in a while, and it's very amazing how much we're able to, to get from that. But I, I, I'm sure there's a lot of the picture that's missing. Do you, what, what, do you think, what do you think the next thing is going to come out there? What are, what are we looking for? What, what will help us sort of further uh, solidify some of these theories? Well, if I'm talking about carnivory, uh, like I said, I, I will publish the paper uh, sooner or later. I'm just waiting for my PhD to arrive. Um, and uh, like I said, I found like 12 biological uh, signs uh, that we evolved to become carnivore. I just told you one. Uh, if we had time, I would go more into it, but, but uh, let's leave it for now. And what I hope is that more people, this time real biologists, get into the teeth into this situation and genetics. And, and start to to try to reconstruct the diet of uh, this is this is my p private uh, you know uh, subject. Try to reconstruct the the human diet based on our present day uh, physiology. Uh, and, and if you use genes, you can also tell more or less when it happened. Uh, sometimes, yeah, you, you not not just what happened. But when? And this is, I think, here uh, we, we can expect some fascinating, fascinating news. So this is as far as future research going on. I wanted to talk, I'll talk much shorter than I wanted because of, because of this time, about McCarrison. Uh, McCarrison was, uh, and the reason I bring him up is because he's not known, and because, by the way, you, you are very interested, I see, about what illnesses are uh, ameliorated uh, by, by, by eating more uh, protein or carnivores diet. And your answer is there, is with the McCarrison. McCarrison in the 20s was a doctor in India or even in, in before the 20s, and he went through the First World War, and the First World War ended, and the British Army uh, realized that he didn't know what to feed these soldiers. So they set up this guy, who was a genius, he, knew, he was known already uh, to be like a genius doctor, and uh, they gave him, he became, he eventually ended up being a major general in, in the British Army. And uh, Sir, uh, by the Queen. Uh, but before that, he established this research center in, in India, and he started with thousands of rats. And you can have thousands of rats if you have a lot of Indians doing the work for you. Uh, to study nutrition and, and what, what its effect on, on illnesses. I don't know if you're going to see it, but this is one of his uh, researches. I'm not sure you can do oh, pop, pop. This is like, a, this is a picture of uh, seven rats. Uh, yeah, seven albino rats, okay? And on the side, you can see pictures of peoples of this area. 
Okay, so this goes all along the paper. And uh, what he did, he took these rats and he fed them diets of the various seven of the peoples of India and measured the rate of growth of these rats. And then he compared it to the size of the actual people. <laughs> and it was the same. Uh, the, the larger, sort of, more robust people were the six. Sick, right? That's what you say. You call them. Sikh, you know, yeah, well, well that's that's how I've always heard it. But they there may be they may have their own pronunciation. But Sikh is, I think, how most people say. Right. That. So the Sikh uh, diet brought the best results, and the Madras's diet brought the wor worst results. So that was enough for him, and he put his one thousand stock uh, rats on the Sikh diet. I don't want to talk about the diets because the actual diet doesn't matter here. What is mat matters is that the difference in diets brought all these results. Uh, and this, he, he kept his stock uh, rats on, on this uh, diet, the Sikh diet, and he started feeding something like 2,000 rats of the Madras diet, the worst diet. And he used to uh, autopsy them, you know, from time to time. And later, he came up with a list of about 80 illnesses, okay, that he, that he uh, list of the rats that ate the, the wrong diets. And you're talking about, I'm just reading you, skin disease, like five of them. Disease of the eye, like four or five of them. Disease of the ear, disease, disease of the nose, disease of, disease of the lungs, Disease of the alimentary tract, including some cancer, uh, urinary tract, reproductive system, blood, lymph, endocrine glands, nervous system, and uh, what else? There was something else. Ah, yeah, bone, and some other general. Okay, some 80 ailments that, that this mice suffered, and the other conditions were exactly the same. They were put in cage, roomy cage, he says, and were brought every day out to the sun for about an hour and brought back. So the other, all the other, and did get, they didn't get much exercise in these cages for sure. So the only difference was food. Food, the difference in food created 80 different illnesses. And then, and this is, by the way, just your last, I think your last... Uh, it was about uh, mental illness. Then he tried the diet of what he called the poor classes of the uh, England. And he says, I must read that. He says this about them, okay? They didn't increase in weight. Their growth was stunted, they were badly proportioned, their coats were star staring and lacking in gloss. Now come the, tie, the thing. They were nervous and apt to bite the attendants. They lived unhappily together, and by the 60th day of the experiment, they became to kill and eat the weaker ones among them. When they had disposed of three in this way, I was compelled to segregate them. The experiment was continued for 187 years, etc., etc., and in this group there was just 20 of them. Six died of pneumonia, and three others were killed by their fellows. So the effect of bad diet, not only on the physical health, but on mental health, is unbelievable. Maybe we have all these wars because we don't eat properly. Hmm. Yeah, we we talked about that in pretty. Good detail with our last guest, uh, Dr. Georgia Ede, and uh, oh yeah, it was oh, yeah. it's it's an interesting kind of like thought experiment to work through to say like well where are we starting with you know this, on the side of mental health and where should we be starting and it's I think it's becoming more and more clear like the first step should be nutrition and then we can start you know adding in other things to help people or uh, you know folks that are you know, dealing with any kind of mental issue. 
Uh, but yeah, it's it's pretty pretty fascinating stuff. Right. My wife is a psychotherapist, and I see it every day here. Mm -hmm. uh, boy, the stories you get and the junk that these people eat. Uh, yeah, it's sad. It's it's so sad that people look at this. This this is information from 1920. The paper actually was published in 1936. And what ha what happened? You see that all these ailments stem from one factor: the wrong diet. Now, instead of dealing with the wrong diet, we are dealing with 80 diseases and develop specific uh, medicine for each disease. This is crazy. Yeah, I, I have to agree. We're, 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 we're totally approaching it the wrong way. We're, all we're doing is putting Band-Aids on. They're expensive. They're, they're side effect prone. And it's, it's ultimately not helping very many people. I think it's just, it's just you know, and, and the, the only thing we continue here is we need new and better drugs. You know, we need more drugs. Yeah. We need better sure. drugs. No, that's not sure. the answer. We need to, we need to fix who we are as a species and what we've, what we've kind of done to ourselves. But it's, it's, it's so fascinating uh, to hear this sort of stuff from an anthropologic uh, uh, perspective. You know, I think we're one of the, you know, health and nutrition is one of the few fields routinely ignores uh, the base of who we are as a species came from, and I do that to our detriment. And it's good to see. Uh, more and more people starting to to look at that and and, and look at uh, how we can sort of improve our health through this evolutionary lens and it's it's uh, very neat. Mickey, it's a pleasure having you on. Uh, maybe when you get that next paper written, you know, we can get you back on there to talk about it because I'm I'm just fascinated. This is one of my favorite uh, interviews so far, just because it's 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 you know a little bit outside of what I'm really comfortable with. But it's just, it's just, it's like going to the movies, you know, watching a, watching a, you know, a dinosaur movie or something like that. <laughs> just, 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 just thinking about all the imagination that's going on and it's, it's wonderful stuff. Zach, any last, any sort of last sort of words there? Yeah, no, it was, it's been our pleasure to have you on. And uh, like Sean said, very interesting topics and definitely learned a lot with this one. I'm sure our, our listeners are going to love it. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. You two are uh, one of my... Uh, Favorite uh, actors in this in this field, <laughs> uh, and I admire your sport, uh, you know, ability and and and, and tenacious, tenacity, tenacity, tenacity. Uh, and I'll be glad. I'll be glad to come back. Wonderful. I, I'm sure we're going to have some people that are going to have lots of interesting comments on this one. So I'm looking forward to releasing this one. Uh, yeah, well, I'm all for having him back on. Uh, you know, like I said, maybe we'll get down the road a little bit as we get more and more popular and more people get to listen because we're, our audience is growing uh, quite a bit by the day. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll be interested to see what your your sort of theory of evolution turns out to be uh, when you get that thing written. All right, maybe just mention that uh, on uh, July, I think, 19th, I have a lecture in the, uh, the Ancestral Health uh, Symposium in Bozen, Montana. Oh. where I discuss uh, the evolutionary dietary ratio. We're bringing a little bit more more information about uh, what I found in the biological side of things. Yeah, of course. Yeah, let us know where else people can find you. I know you've got a, a Twitter account. That's how I think I contacted you. But um, yeah, Ancestral Health uh, Symposium 2018 in Bozeman, Montana in July. Wonderful. Uh, I wish I could go to that thing. That would be fun to go to. Uh, maybe maybe one of these years I'll get out there. Uh, any other way, Any other things we need to let people know to, to, to either contact you or, or to, to where they can get more information from you, Mickey? Well, I'm, I'm quite reachable. Uh, you know, I give out my email. I, <laughs> I uh, you know, I have a blog, paleostyle.com. Uh, in English, I, in, I have a blog in Hebrew, which I do like over 300, I think, posts, uh, because this is, you know, my my home my homeland, and uh, uh, I feel obliged to 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 share the information. Uh, there are enough clever people doing that in the United States, so I have a blog in English, but it's uh, I write it not very often. I may write a post on McCarrison because now I have all the information uh, gathered again. Uh, so I may write a post about him. Wonderful. All right, Jack. I think we'll let let Mickey get back to your day. Uh, okay. Enjoy. Enjoy. Well, I guess it's evening in, in Tel Aviv. So enjoy your evening, right. and, and and tell your wife thanks for letting us steal you for 
uh, an hour or so. And uh, oh, she has. She's now have a patient, so she doesn't care too much. <laughs> yeah. Thank. Thank you so much, Mickey. It was great to have you okay. on. Okay.